What if this happens? Oh my God, I'm afraid to do that. <gasps> I don't know what the outcome is going to be. Oh my God, I'm afraid. I'm scared. That is all the fear of the unknown. That fear of the unknown is preventing you from living, not just a little bit. It is preventing from preventing you from all of the things in which you can accomplish. Let's chat about it right now. Check it out. Hey, 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 everybody, and welcome back to the Positivity Experience. It's your girl, Lori. Man, am I excited that you're here. Uh, I'm, I'm always happy to talk to you guys. It's like one of my favorite things on the planet to do. And we are going to talk about the fear of the unknown, which is one, again, to piggyback on last week's podcast about accepting things as they are, not as you want them to be. This goes hand in hand because this is one big piece of that. And it really needed its its own podcast. Now, I will tell you over on Patreon, I'm going to have a really good worksheet there for you to kind of go through it and say, okay, this is these are my potential areas and it's going to have you identify it. And then this is the strategies that you can incorporate to help that cognitive restructuring. This is a cognitive restructure. So we know that during trauma and all of those other things, while it can change sort of like that wiring in your brain, you can cognitively restructure this. You see this a lot in cognitive behavioral therapy. You'll see this in dialectical therapy. You'll see this in other things because it's about that cognitive restructuring, understanding, accepting different viewpoints, different challenges, how you can think about it. And so your neuroplasticity, not to sound too nerdy here, but your neuroplasticity, like, yeah, like you can really help that restructure in order to kind of like rewire your brain even better than it was before. But it's going to take a lot of work and a lot of effort. And over on the Patreon abundance, once a month, uh, I do an abundance. It's the highest tier on Patreon. And I'm doing a video over there. So we get that once a month. And it kind of goes even deeper on that from a very personal level with real life coping strategies and, and stuff like that too. So if that's your jam, feel free to jump over to patreon.com forward slash the positivity experience or click or copy the link anywhere that you're getting this podcast right now in the show notes, which is the description. Uh, but yeah, so let's jump in this because it's so important. So Oh, the fear of the unknown, you'll see this a lot if you have severe anxiety disorders or even just a little bit of anxiety disorder, uh, bipolar, OCD, uh, anything. But by the way, you don't have to be clinically diagnosed with anything, honestly, um, to just kind of be a little uneasy about things that you just don't know, right? That's that's not abnormal. It is where it, be where it becomes problematic is when it is debilitating. It's preventing you from taking action. It's preventing you from living your life. And then if you think about the things that you can't control and you think about, well, what's going to happen, it can spiral you almost into a panic attack, right? A big one of that is fear of death. Okay, we're going to talk a little bit about that. And, you know, yeah, I mean, I'm going to give a little trigger warning here. Uh, I would encourage you to try to work through that just because exposure is going to really help you. That's a that's a big piece of, of this is to expose yourself to things that um, are going to like shake you a little bit and and you will be fine, I promise. But it, it, there's a big piece of that and it doesn't matter. Now, if you have a certain spiritual practice, I we're not going to get into certain religions and stuff like that here, but if you have a spiritual practice, if you have something that you believe in somewhere, so it can be a lot easier for you at times, a lot easier at times. But at the end of the day, you're not out running it, right? So Again, little little trigger warning. You can fast forward ahead. What do we have? Four minutes. You could fast forward to like seven minutes, right? And then you're going to miss about three minutes of this if it's too triggering about death. So go go now. Okay, so you're here. And the thing is, is if you really think about it right now, just really think about it. Not about well, these are who the people I'm going to see. Uh, uh. Think about your own because that's what you want. Now I talked across over people. You guys know that. But even though I I, I do that, it doesn't mean that I don't have some level of disease, disease, you know, like uneasiness with it. But you don't want it to be debilitating because when when you can't accept it or anything else for that matter, it becomes so problematic. So think about it right now and say, do you fully accept that? Okay, it doesn't matter. Going back to what I said, it is what it is. That is the ultimate equalizer. 
I don't care if you're Taylor Swift. I don't care if you're the biggest football player, the biggest celebrity, the biggest priest, the biggest anything in the world. It is the ultimate equalizer. It equalizes everybody and that's the destination in this lifetime. Don't worry about afterlife. I'm talking about in this lifetime. That is the end game, whether you like it or not. So if you struggle with that, that's a huge, huge piece of fear of the unknown. You can be the most religious person, the most spiritual person and still have a fear of it. Because at the end of the day, and then it's, it, and I'll tell you, it's, it's, it's difficult for me because of my anxiety disorder, watching my mom go through it, everything was death oriented, uh, but she did die once and she, she told me or she told everybody what she saw and then she didn't have a fear of death. But because I deal with a lot of scientists and a lot of professors, because I'm always learning more about the human behavior, you know, and then you have those conflicting, this causes that dissonance, right? Where you're like, well, this is my belief system. And then you talk to like certain scientists and certain things. And it's like, yeah, well, once you go, like your consciousness is gone. Like you're just worm food, basically. That's that's how they put it, right? And if you fear that, then all your life, you're going to be avoiding it and you're not going to be living. So it's about asking yourself, how do you fear and how do you feel the unknown about that? Yeah, so that's the reason I use that example is it's one of the biggest examples that's been in my life, but has been in many people's lives. So, and and honestly, once you've gone on that level, hell, everything else, you're like, I don't care if this relationship works out. I don't care if this job works out. It's all minor, right? It's all, it all, it is minutia, right? Okay, so all for all of the people coming back in, I won't talk about that that specific topic anymore, other than maybe I'll just glance over it. And but it's important. So if you're in a space and you're like, well, but what if this relationship, what if this job, what if this situation doesn't work out? Then it doesn't work out. Right? So what? You know, I, I'm a big fan of worst case scenario and then positive case, the best case scenario. So what I always do within myself and then within my clients, especially probably even more with them is we'll go down if we're working together. Oh, we'll go down the worst case scenario. I mean, I want it catastrophe, catastrophize it. What's that going to look like? See, I'm a little bit different because everybody's like, oh, I don't think that way. Uh, uh-uh. Because then if you're not allowing yourself to run that course, that tape in your head for a minute, if you don't allow it to run, that creates anxiety because you're trying to squelch it. You're trying to hide it, right? So with that being said, once you go, because at some point you will exhaust that negativity. Well, but then this could happen. Okay. And then what? Well, then that could happen. Okay. And then let's go even worse than that. Well, then this. At some point, you're going to bottom out. At some point, you are going to exhaust every possibility. That's, again, I do that a lot with my clients, right? Because, and that might not just be in one session. Worst case scenario is this, and then this, and then this, and then this, and then that's it. I mean, you've done worst case scenario, you're done it all. Okay, cool. Got that? Cool, got it. What's the best case scenario? Well, I mean, best case scenario is it works out. Mm, what does that mean? Well, then I'm happy. Mm, what does that mean? Because happiness is not a thing. You're not achieving happiness. That's a blanket. We all say it. Oh, I want to be happy. But what does that mean? My happiness is different than your happiness. Your happiness is different than somebody else's happiness. So it's forcing yourself to, and without being nauseating. Well, then I'll be famous and then I'll date you know, this person, I, I don't, I mean, within the situation, what's the best case scenario? So mind you, you've already catastrophized. So you might as well live the high life. Well, I could get a lot of money and then I would have my boat. Really? And then what? Well, I'd even get another house. Where? Paris. Oh, that's great. Okay. So of course, we've done both sides of it, right? We've, we've literally done the polar opposites. Worse, worse, worse. Best, best, best. And then there's that in between right? Because then after a while, you go, okay, well, hmm, well, what does that mean? So that's what we call the gray area. You've heard this probably more than one time. It's being in the gray area. And right now you might not be able to see it because you're in black and white thinking because you're catastrophizing and then you're trying to control the narrative, but you can't. Life is largely out of your control, right? The things that are in control, mindset. Yep, your mindset. Your mindset might naturally be negative, 
well, we can restructure that. Don't give into it. Don't become a victim to that. Be like, I can't help it. I'm just negative. Then you're not going to help it. Then, oh, well, because you just literally said, I don't want to make an effort to get better. That's exactly what you said. I want to feel better. Okay, well, let's do this. Why? I don't know. I'm just negative. Dissonance. Those are two. Di- what? What you say, you know, and what you do are two very diff- different things. Right? So, Again, I, I like to take it as far as I can, catastrophizing it, and then all the way to the top, and then going, okay. Because after a while, you start going, oh, okay, I'm, I'm mindful of this. But at the end of the day, it's largely out of your control, right? So when you're in that space, and, and, and you go, well, well, what if this is happening? And, and what if this doesn't? And it, let's say you're in college, and you're like, oh my God, I got this big test. <gasps> what if I fail? Okay, you fail. Yeah, but then I got to wait. Okay, so what? Okay, so you got to wait. Yeah, but then it's not going to go when I'm supposed to. When you're supposed to, what does that mean? Well, that's when I wanted to do it. Oh, you're emotionally attached to an outcome. Do you see how last week's podcast and this week's podcast are married together? Because you're going to find that most of your unknown fears, like your fear of the unknown, is this expectation of perfectionism or things that you're trying to achieve not on your time? I mean, on your time. Well, you don't know if it's going to work out then. Well, you, it always works out. Just doesn't always work out the way you want it to. So that's a big piece of it, right? You love the predictability of life. You love that comfort zone. It's predictable. You get up, Maybe you work out, maybe you'd have some coffee, you go to work, you come home, maybe you make dinner, maybe not, you sit down. Like it's predictable. It's the unknown. But oh my God, those last minute things, the unknown is so great. That's where growth is. That's where everything lives. Which goes into the very next reason why you struggle with your the fear of the unknown is exactly what I just said, perfectionism. Please know, and I'll say this as many times as I need to repeat it, perfectionism is not real. It is unachievable. You cannot, I don't like to use always a never, but I'm using it here. You will never be perfect and no one will ever be perfect. And the reason I say it that way is because if you have perfectionism, you're holding people to some bizarro high standard of like, this is how it's got to be. Because if you don't do it this way, it's wrong. If you don't load the dishwasher this way, it's wrong. No, it isn't. You didn't fold the towels right. No, 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 no. I didn't fold the towels the way you fold them. Okay, so the perfectionism doesn't just affect you. It affects everybody around you, right? Oh, well, don't do it this way. Well, don't do it that way. You're allowed to have your, your sort of way of doing things and standard practices. But perfectionism is not real. So when you're fearing the unknown, you're fearing failure, which is a whole different topic. Failure is spectacular. Failure is beautiful. And you never, ever, ever fail. You learn. That cognitive restructuring in your brain is going to be important here. This is mindset. Okay, so a lot of your fear of the unknown is fearing as though, what if you fail? It's not going to be on your time. The emotional outcome that I attach this to, uh, but this is what I was supposed to do. Well, now, no, the universe said no. You're not going to outrun the universe. You will never outsmart the universe. Just because you're not writing in your negative journal does not mean that the universe is like, hmm, this person's positive. No. You still put that energy out. Energy doesn't lie whether you write it on a piece of paper or not. It it doesn't matter. Okay, so when you're in that space, it's important that you understand and accept it as it is. Now, number three in that goes with past experiences. You may have said, okay, well, did that before. That didn't work out very well. Okay, now you're a prisoner to your past experiences. I mean, learn, just say, okay, that didn't work out really well. Let me try something different. You don't keep trying the same thing, definition of insanity, emotional attachment to that outcome. You don't keep doing that. That's correct. Correct. Mm -hmm. But just because you had a past experience, let's say it's a relationship. You had a a relationship that seemed like it was going well till it wasn't going well. And now you don't know who you could trust and all these things. So now you're bringing this past relationship that you have with this person into this next relationship, which is not that person's responsibility to fix 
you know? So if you had a bad relation, let's say you had a decent relationship, but then you were excited, blindsided, you had this horrendous experience. Let's just make it dramatic. Horrendous experience. And now it's been a, a little bit. Now you're kind of ready to jump out back in the dating pool. But are you? Right? So if that person betrayed you because they were hanging out with some girl at, at work and then they hooked up, okay? And this new person is also at a job and has some, and, and you think these girls are kind of pretty that he works with. If you're going in there insecure, do not, not get in a relationship. Do not, you're not ready yet. Because until you're ready to accept that not everybody is that ex person, then you're, you're not ready. And it's also not his or their responsibility to keep reassuring you because you were screwed over. No, 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 no. That is already setting up a relationship in a very, very negative way. So just because you have a past experience, you can't sit there and just hold on to it over and over and over again and then worry about what the outcome is. I mean, sure, there's going to be some things that you're just going to be like, oh God, I don't want to do that again. Okay, that's fine. But you can't do that across the board with everything. It's going to be really problematic. Now, the very next one goes hand in hand with that is and that's your cognitive bias, which we've talked about multiple times. Okay, you do not like ambu- God, here goes that word again, ambiguous situations. You like it to where it is predicted and not just is what it is. You, for some odd reason, want it to have an emotion so bad. And so you're looking for that cognitive closure that I've talked about on my short form video, where on cognitive closure means you just, you just want the why. You do not. That it, no. You do not need the cognitive closure. While it is a human natural response to desire it, to put your life on hold for it, to feel like you have to have it in order to move on. You do not need the apology to move on, possibly to have that person maybe in your life, but you don't need it to move on. There's a lot that comes into play. Your cognitive bias says, I think things should be this way. And then when you're like, oh my God, what if they're not that way? Well, that kind of goes back into perfectionism again. So, right? And so you really have to know in your head and you really have to think about this, right? Is so what if you don't know what it is? Going, so what if it doesn't work out? And wow, but then it's going to be bad. Okay, let's go down that rabbit hole again. What does that mean? Let's catastrophize it for a minute, but do it until you bottom out. And what you will find, I've, I've done it with myself, I've done it with everybody else. At first, you're like, oh my gosh. And then after a while, you're like, oh, wow, I really, where did that come from? Like, I really went down the rabbit hole in that way to the point where you almost laugh at yourself. You're like, wow, I really, woo, I really went above and beyond. And you got to laugh at yourself. If you can't laugh at yourself, if you can't appreciate that piece about yourself, then it's going to be a very difficult life for you. If you're taking yourself too serious, if you're worried about the judgment of other people, if you're worried about all those things, it's going to be a very difficult life for you because you will always, always be in a space of need to be in control, need to make people happy, which you can't do, by the way, uh, need for uh, approval, all of those things. That is not living. Okay? It's not shaming. It's not any of that. I'm telling you, you're not living. Oh, and by the way, I've been there. Remember, I've been there. So I can even talk about it even more because I promise you I've been there. And when you allow yourself to just lay down your sword and be like, oh God, okay. Oh, I guess I'm here. I'm going to do the work. Again, you're going to have to suspend instant gratification. You're going to have to make some sacrifices. Are you willing to do that? Okay. And let me tell you here, this is a this is the next one. Huh. And this is huge, huge, oh my God, so controlling too, is that social conditioning. Well, this is what we don't do. Everybody uses it, we. Well, you don't, we don't do that. Well, why don't we do that? What do you mean we don't do that? We're not in France. Why are we, we, we? Okay, so you have to understand that a lot of this is social conditioning and a lot of this social conditioning, right, is a way of control as well. A person has every single right. You have every single right to do things as you do it. Every single right. As does the other person. As do the people around you. We don't, don't say we don't. I don't. I don't allow maybe that, uh, that experience or whatever around you. Great, that's a boundary. 
But what you're not going to do and what you don't do is you don't condition yourself on such a social level that now it has to be achieved because if you don't, who knows what's going to happen? Is this person going to like you? Are they going to talk to you anymore? Maybe, maybe not. Now that's a whole other ballgame because that goes into attachment issues, uh, unresolved trauma, uh, high levels of, of, of various mood disorders. Like there's a lot that comes into play. But again, it's a reason, not an excuse. So that goes into the next one, which is anxiety disorders, right? General anxiety disorder, OCD, other mood stabilizers, uh, mood disorders, and things like that. It does go in there to have the, that fear. You know, I know you've done this before, or some of you have, where you, you kind of get on the merry-go-round. You're like, okay, well, I was just thinking about this. And, and this is another thing by, went with me, don't necessarily do that excessive catastrophizing going down to the bottom on your own do that if like you're with me or with somebody else who who practices what they do in the same way because I don't want you to like panic on your own like you kind of needs to be somewhat controlled uh, or safe you know safe controlled but what you have to realize is a lot of that loop so you get on that that merry-go-round and now the overthinking brain comes in you're like okay and then you just kind of get on this loop this pattern this path oh Oh, we're back there. We're thinking of that again. Hmm, it's funny. Been thinking about this all day long. Holy hell, it's tomorrow. I'm still thinking about it. Oh, holy hell. It's a week from now. It's the same exact scenario. That's where you do a pattern interrupt, which I have tons of stuff on and more stuff coming out about pa- pattern interrupters. Uh, and it's big because I mean, I have OCD as far as obsessive thinking. So I can promise you if there's anybody on this planet talking to you right now that knows obsessive thoughts, I got you. Because obsessive thoughts and intrusive thoughts are very much connected, very much married, right? And it's not about trying to make them go away. I tell you guys this all the time. You got to stop fighting the anxiety. You got to stop fighting it. And you got to stop trying to make it go away, make it go away, make it go away. What you resist persists and what you run from will chase you. So there is a methodology to it. There's a practice to it. And I know a lot of you listening to this are my clients in different parts of the world. And, and somebody, last week, somebody asked me, um, you know, how could you make an appointment? Go right to my website. I do it with everybody all over the world, babe. You can be anywhere. It's all virtual. Okay. Unless I'm doing a speaking gig. And, but anyway, so that's, those are some very important things. I mean, the work around the solutions to these things are the cognitive restructuring. It's, it's understanding that by the way, if you're X amount of years old, you're 30, you're 60, you're 20, you're 90. It's taken you that many years to get to where you are. You've done it that way for so long that this instant gratification of just wanting to feel better, just wanting to fix it, just wanting to solve it, just wanting to make sure it's done. Want you, okay, that's not a thing. That's not going to happen. Okay? And it's extremely, extremely important that you understand that because all of these go hand in hand. So if you take... Mm, like probably the last, let's say, well, definitely last week's podcast, but even the personalization bias and taking things personal, you can kind of see how they all sort of work together, right? Because if you're taking things personal, it's basically a bias because you're saying, well, wait, that doesn't, wait, you're not supposed to judge me because that doesn't fit into my plan. Ah, dissonance. Well, dissonance. And then here we are with this, right? Conflicting and you're trying to figure out what it is. You're trying to control way too many things right? Control is always going to be an issue. You have got to go with the flow. You got to allow yourself to have your feelings that are not facts. Your thoughts are not facts. Your feelings are not facts, but you got to allow yourself to have them. They got to have somewhere to go. They got to have somewhere to go. The five journals, you keep resisting the five journals all you want. I'm telling you, it is one of the most effective things. I've used them. It has helped me tremendously over one journal. Okay. And they're individualized. If in fact that's your jam, you can go see that on, on my YouTube under the five journal series. But you know, all of those things are, are, are like really important. You know, exposure. You got to expose yourself to this stuff. Like let's say you have, uh, this isn't, shouldn't be too, it might be a little triggering, but you don't have to jump away from it. Is if you have death anxiety, you go to the funeral home, you pick out your stuff, you plan your own funeral. I know it sounds scary, but what you do is there's a certain level of control. So it's kind of giving you a little level of control of what that's going to look like, even though you're not going to have any control when you're gone, nor will you care. Uh, but exposing yourself to the, to the unknown, exposing yourself to the fears of the unknown. Okay. And of course, then there's the regulation coping strategy techniques, 
right? Because if you're not regulating your emotions, your emotions are going to regulate you. That's just how life works. If you are not regulation, re- regulation emotions, wow. If you are not regulating your emotions, which can be difficult when you have a mood disorder, you have something else, doesn't mean it's impossible. But as you work on those restructuring and, and, and the things that you need to do for that restructuring, the better that that is going to be for you. It is going to give you a directional space to go, hmm, okay, so there are opportunities. The issue is you try so hard to control what that unknown is or that fear of the unknown that all you can do is go, how can I stop this? How can I stop this? How can I prevent this? I need to know right now. Yeah, no. And and then what makes it harder is you're on the obsessive loop. You're trying to make it make sense. You're trying to rationalize it. You're trying to understand it. You don't have to understand it. You ever see something where, I mean, I, I think we've all done this somewhat from a human perspective. It just doesn't affect me. I'm just like, it's whatever. But sometimes you go, why would the person do that? That's stupid. Like, why is the person doing blank, 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 blank? Because they are. Why? That's dumb. Why? I don't like that. You don't have to. Where are you struggling to accept it as it is? Do you see how, do you see how these go hand in hand? Where are you struggling? Because I don't like it. It doesn't matter what you like. Not, not when it comes to them. It matters what you like for yourself. It matters what you're going to have around you for yourself. Yes, it doesn't have to matter to them, right? And their issues and the way that they do things and the way, if it does not serve your best and highest good, you got to distance from it. If it doesn't serve your best and highest good, distance from it. It's that easy. I know it doesn't sound easy. Simplicity. And no, I understand that you might have an emotional attachment. You might have all of these other things that come into play. That's fine. Might make it more difficult. It's not going to make it impossible. I promise you it's not going to be impossible. But you have to be willing to be vulnerable. And vulnerability is a superpower. Okay? Hear me on this. Vulnerability is a superpower. I'm talking about within yourself. I don't mean, you know, you have to just put yourself as like a moving target in the world. I'm saying for yourself, being honest with yourself, being communicative to the people around you. It's like, do you know how many people set boundaries, but then they never articulate it? They just assume a person's supposed to know because they're like, well, you wouldn't do it. So you should know why. And remember, boundaries are not boundaries without a consequence in which you carry, but the other person has to know what it is. You just can't implement something that nobody knows, but you only say it once, not twice, not three times, not more. And so when you're in the unknown, and like I said, over on Patreon, it is a really good worksheet. It is meant to be a little triggering, not going to lie to you, because it's going to ask you some questions, and it's going to force you to be honest. But remember this, self-acceptance, self-actualization, being honest with yourself is the only way that you're going to grow. That's it. There's no shortcut here, babe. There's no shortcut. There's no ease of it. There's no, no. Okay, so the next time that you go, well, what if this doesn't work out? It's okay. It will always work out. So you got to tell yourself that. Because if you're going, what if this doesn't work out? You don't really believe that it always works out. Okay, because your perfectionism comes into play. Your, oh my God, this is what it's supposed to be comes into play. Your ego comes into play. But at the end of the day, remember, and this is just what I've taught within Buddhism and everything is, things are not good, they are not bad, they just are. I mean, that's just a fact. Things are not good. They're not bad. They just are. Because everybody has a different belief system at times. Everybody sees things as problematic or not problematic. And they're, everybody's right for themselves. And when you can get there, when you can honestly say, I can see things from a different perspective, you don't have to change your mind. But when you say, I can see things from a different perspective, now we're making progress. Now we're making progress. I can see that. And I don't mean you don't just say, well, we can agree to disagree. Like we don't need to do it with an attitude. Okay. But when you're able to do that, you're able to experience, you know, I would say, you know, for me, I mean, I, I kind of like to expose myself to other things to where it is so triggering for me so I can address the trigger. So like I said, if you're di- with the first situation when I had said it's a trigger warning for people to jump off, You have two conflicting things, which causes the dissonance, maybe what your belief system is to what science is saying. And then people get very selective. I believe in science. Well, no, I don't like that part of science. Well, do you believe in science or you don't? Well, I mean, kind of. No, you can't kind of. It either either you do or you don't. So then when you're conflicted from a spiritual or religious perspective into 
a belief system, but then science disputes that, then you almost have a hard time going, oh my God, what do I, holy hell, what do I do with that information? Because you want to believe science, if, if you're a science believer, um, you know, you want to believe science and you say you believe science, but you don't like what science thinks here and then you disagree with it. Dissonance. So guys, the unknown is where everything good exists and it's going to take time. You got to be willing to, and you got to be willing to be vulnerable. And when you are, you start really accepting things. Check it out.